All right, let's get into this. I want to talk about joy and pain. As many of you are aware, um, this week culture lost someone significant, which we call DMX. It, it kind of always does something to me when I see someone overdose. Um, partially, my former pastor died that way. Um, I have sibling, a sibling who, who is um, addicted to that life. So it, it really has mixed emotions. Um, I, I watched a video. I think I'm going to post it on my page. I think it's important for you to watch um, and give to your children and how he talks about how at the age of 14, someone that he respected uh, tried to get him to smoke a blunt and he wasn't interested, but they, they pushed him on to do it. And then when he smoked it, because of the admiration that he had for the person, it was laced with crack. And he said, from that moment, the monster grew. And uh, it's easy to cast judgment on people when you don't know their story and you don't know their struggle. Uh, I'm very sensitive to that because I remember being that judgmental person and I would say to my sibling, like, why, why don't you just pray and stop? And I remember driving down the road with her and she breaking down and saying, if it was that easy, I would. Just like your body hungers for food, so does mine crave for what I desire. And when I don't get it, it starts sending shock signals, causing me to shiver and convulse. And at that moment, I realized I was a judgmental Christian because I did not experience the level of pain that she experienced and could not relate to it. And so as we are looking at this particular text, the beautiful, beautiful, beautiful picture of life is this. There are moments of joy. But the downside of life is that there are moments of pain. And I recall him saying in an interview, because I thought it was beautiful how it fit with this sermon, is that he said, my life is like a blessing and a curse. And many of you can relate to that. And in one sense, everything in your world is amazing. And then on another side, you've got to learn how to deal with things that you never thought you'd have to deal with. And so it is always a challenge when we are now Christians and we sign up to be part of this faith, and we are expecting to get a crown when we die, but we don't realize that in order to get to the crown, you got to go through the cross. And so as much as I would love to kind of preach this message with fire, I want to talk it to you because I think there's a lot of things that you and I need to reflect on. Um, Pain is, is, a, is a real thing, and, and, and being a Christian doesn't always mean that you know how to manage your pain. This text in Hebrews tells us something very important in Hebrews 12. It says that Jesus, the pioneer of our faith, endured the cross, and there are many who are in heaven who are part of the cloud of witnesses that are cheering us on so that when we get frustrated and we get tired, we can look to their faith and say, most of the disciples who followed Jesus were crucified. Peter was crucified upside down, naked, hung upside down on a cross. John, I believe, was beheaded or boiled on the island of Patmos. Stephen was stoned to death. They took a bunch of rocks and just threw it at him until he died. And so this text simply tells us that whenever you get discouraged, know there are people that went ahead of you that face far worse. So just because you're being talked about in the church and just because social media is not being nice to you, they're not liking your stuff, they would trade for your pain. It's not to minimize your pain because many of us have stories that are horrendous. But the reality is, is that everything is filled with joy and pain. Marriage is filled with joy and it's also filled with pain. Children are filled with joy and they're also filled with pain. Jobs are filled with joy and they're also filled with pain. Your body has seasons of joy and then it has seasons of pain. You cannot escape the reality of joy and pain. Hebrews 12 is pretty clear that God wanted to get to the crown, but
but could not get to the crown without going through the cross. And so I want to just really highlight that we are surrounded by people who have been through what we've been through. And they're cheering us on because they don't want us to become weary in the pain. Genesis 35 is really my text, but I, I need to kind of use this as the bedrock text, of course. Genesis 35 is one that I want you to turn to. Genesis 35 is a passage about a man named Jacob. And if you were to do a character study on Jacob, it's, it's an amazing story. I can tell you this, that I don't know any leader in Scripture that didn't know how to manage joy and pain. Moses had to learn how to manage leading people and manage his own pain while leading people. So you will never achieve a level of Christian faith or greatness, as we like to say, without pain. How we tolerate pain determines how enjoyable our life is. Let the church say amen. amen. Genesis 35, uh, this is such a profound passage of scripture, you may need your tissue for this. Jacob is a trickster. He's born a trickster. He didn't ask to be born a trickster. He just was a trickster because when you're born in the sin, you don't get to choose your struggle. You, you didn't choose to be an alcoholic. You were born in the sin, shaping in iniquity. So, so De J Jacob is born a trickster. And, and verse number, let me see where I want to go. There's a lot to read, but let me just kind of set it up this way. And I'll read the verse I want to read. Jacob finds a woman that he likes. Her name is Rachel. The dad says, if you want to be with my daughter, that's fine. Because in those days, they had to arrange marriages. So you want to be with my daughter? Cool. Let's agree that I'm going to give you my daughter. He says, bet, let's agree. The dad ends up tricking him on the honeymoon night. He gives him his other daughter, Leah. He wakes up and says, that's not who I thought I married. The dad said, I know, I tricked you. Because isn't it amazing you attract who you are? So a lot of times we're like, I don't want this negative energy around me. Maybe it's because you're negative. And what you're attracted is a reflection of who you are. So now here, here's what happens with Jacob. He ends up finally working for seven years to get the other woman. He finally works seven years, spends his entire life suffering to get this other woman called Rachel. That's who he really wanted. And then Rachel has a challenge because she's pretty but can't have a baby. So on one side, everybody celebrates you publicly, but privately you're in pain because you can't produce. I don't care how great you are. I could look at your life and say, okay, great. I see all the necklaces. I see all the jewelry, but I want to see your pain tolerance. I saw your Benz. It looks good. I saw your Bentley. I saw your Hyundai. I saw your Toyota. I saw, I saw it all, but I need to know your pain tolerance because the greater that God pushes you higher, that means the greater level of pain that you have to endure because you cannot be great without great pain. Is it making sense to you online and in the church? So now Genesis 35, here's what happens. After serving seven years, verse number 16, he leaves Bethel because God changes his name from Jacob to Israel. Here's the crazy part. Even though God changed his name to Israel, we still call him Jacob. Because people will not let you free from your last mistake. Even though God changed his name, we still say Jacob because people will not let you free from the prison of your past mistake. This is not a justification for some of you who are problematic to say, that's right, pastor, sometimes you're just a problem 
and you're only a prisoner to the decisions that you consistently make. So now here's what happens. Rachel finally gets pregnant. She has a baby and she's pregnant, y'all. Can you imagine your whole life not being able to produce a child? And you know, church folk have a tendency of asking you stuff. Family members have a tendency of asking you stuff. So when are you going to have a baby? And you got to constantly downplay it and say, well, when the Lord wants. But inside you're bleeding because you know that's an area of your life that's painful, that you don't really want to share with people. And now all of a sudden, she finally has this child. And when she's about to give birth, the, now Jacob finished worshiping God because God changes his name and he goes to a place and names it Bethel because that's where God changed his name. Now his wife, he goes from a season of joy. Thank you, Lord. You changed my name. And now I'm having a child. And when his wife is about to give birth to this child, she ends up dying. She names the child Benoni, which means son of my sorrow. And Jacob says, no, 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 no. I'm not going to let you name him son of my sorrow. We're going to change his name to Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. And this morning, I want to talk for a few moments of time. It's all about the Benjamin. Because if you and I look at this story, he spent seven years to be with a woman, to finally get the woman, and finally get to experience what they've been praying for, and now has to experience watching his wife die while watching his son live. How do you celebrate life and death at the same time. This is where many of us are going to find ourselves when we're loving people and we're burying them and now all of a sudden we got to learn how to navigate between life and death. The joy of seeing her, the joy of pruning his love for his girl. I don't think he was just proving. I think God... God used that seven years to prune his love. Because if you're willing to work seven years for somebody, that means you love them. That's a great principle to really borrow. Let's stop investing our lives in people who gave us seven minutes and it's stop ignoring the people who gave us seven years. So, so Jacob is watching his wife have birth contractions. Baby, just push. God's going to do it for us. This is the miracle we've been waiting for. And in the moment of about to having this baby, before that, let me, let me go back. Before that, when he's at Bethel, he pours on the altar a drink offering, which is sacrifice which means something had to experience pain to be on this altar. And then he pours oil, which oil is a symbol of joy, symbol of the anointing, that at every altar, something dies and something lives. You've got to be able to go through the pain of falling away from something that used to be familiar to you. You know, you may be saying, like, God, I want you to change me, but here's the reality. What if change is painful? Because if you've been used to tricking people, it's hard now to adjust to a new life that doesn't feel normal. Okay, come here, church. Some of you got street savviness. And in your street savviness, you still keep that when you deal with people. And it's hard for you to adjust to just being normalized because you're so used to being street. And now you're saved and God is asking you to be conformed. It doesn't mean that you ignore every aspect of the streets because some of it is positive. But the reality is, is how do you change when you're so used to being who you were? And everybody's just telling you, you need to change. Well, how? 
You need to stop with how I've been tricking my entire life. And now I'm at the altar and I'm pouring oil and water because I know that in order for me to change, I've got to experience joy and pain. She experiences the joy of birth and the difficulty of it. You will never birth anything that will not bring you joy. But you will never birth anything that will not bring you pain. If you and I learn this as part of our faith, we'll do very well because we will stop being so disappointed with pain and realize that it comes and you're not the only one that's going through pain. You're not the only one going through frustration. Joy and pain, they are twins. They live in the same house. But here it is. Listen to this. She gave birth and died. What you birth may also cost you your identity. Woo, here it goes. Be careful what you birth because Rachel would tell you, be careful what you birth because it may cost you you. That you cannot birth something that does not cost you you. See, a lot of us want to birth some. A lot of us want to be used by God, but we want to be used by God at our terms. We want to be used by God at our standards. We, we want to be used by God on our schedule. I'm not ready, God. I only want to be used this amount of time. And God's like, you know what? I don't want to use someone that wants to be leased. I want to use someone that wants to be owned by me. And if God is going to, I know this is not popular Christianity, but it's important. If God is going to use you, he's going to let pain flow through you because you cannot have a cross and a crown. They both work together. There's no way you're going to worship up here and sing these songs and not experience it. You, you can sing for a while and God's going to let you sing. He's going to be like, okay, cool, that's fine, that's cute. That's cute. All right. Now I need you to experience it so the next time you sing, people can feel it's not just a song. You at the altar, baby. I'm going to love you from here. I'm going to love you. 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 But how can you love when pain wasn't part of the vows? I know you said it. You didn't believe it. You meant in sickness and in health. You really did not believe that applied to you. It's like when you watch the show, when you see people robbing other people's house, you're like, that's happening to them. That's not going to happen to me. But when it happens to you, what most of us do is inst instead of us dealing with the pain, we get rid of it. Not recognizing whatever you don't face today will face you in your tomorrow. Woo, I'm preaching better than you talking to me. I'm by the CD myself. Here, here it is. She named her pain what she felt instead of what he was. You got to be careful what you name things. Don't name something in a permanent season and make it in a temporary season and make it permanent. You, you got to be careful what you name a thing. Because she was in pain and in that moment she said, you're the son of my sorrow. So the rest of his life he would have been known as, you're the one that killed your mama. Some of you were birthed into trauma. You didn't even ask for it, but you were born into it. And you got to live out your entire days, 14 years old, hitting a joint, and it got cracking it. And it wasn't your fault, but it is your problem. And I know it wasn't your fault. I know you didn't ask for any of the things that happened. But it still doesn't deny the fact that it is your problem. You are responsible now for the pain that you are dealing with. And at the moment, Jacob says, no, 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 no. I will not let your pain cause you to medicate your pain with poisonous words. You dumb like your daddy. 
Well, if the daddy dumb, does that make you dumb because you chose the daddy? You dumb like your mama. Does that make you dumb because you chose the mama? Don't spew out poison to medicate your pain. It doesn't work. You don't have to do it. It doesn't make it better. It makes you bitter. Jacob names him son of my right hand because I can't label you sorrow. Don't let pain be a limit to you. You got to learn how to hop into the game. Because you do know Jacob, whose name means trickster, changed into Israel. Even though God delivered him, he still had a limp from his past. And everywhere he walked, he would limp. And everywhere he would walk, he would limp. Everywhere he would walk, he would limp. Because even though God brings you into a new season, sometimes you got to learn how to deal with the pain of the old season. Sometimes you got to learn how to deal with the pain of the old season. And I know you were betrayed, and I know it hurts, but you got to learn how to deal with the pain in the new season. And even though it hurts, you cannot let the pain of your past be a decision maker for your future. You will stop loving people. You will stop growing with people because of the pain of your past. That's how Satan gets us in bondage. Because you hurt me, I ain't dealing with nobody. And you got to learn how to draw joy from a memory that brings you pain. Yeah, you got to learn how to draw joy from memories that produce you pain. Because some pains are not pains, they're lessons. Some of us were born in the pain. You ain't asked for it. If you admit it, you're hard to love. Because you were born in pain. And in, in a ring doesn't fix you. three-letter word doesn't fix you. This is a deep one. Y'all ready? It's really deep. Y'all ready? Here it is. Sometimes it's not the pain that kills us. It's what we use to deal with the pain that kills us. It's not the pain that kills us. It's what we use to deal with the pain that kills us. You're not a pornography fanatic because of porn. You just don't know how to deal with pain. You're not a drunk because you are drunk. You're a drunk because you don't know how to deal with the pain. It's not just the pain that's killing you. It's how you're treating the pain that's also killing you. And if you don't learn how to treat your pain well, you'll start blowing up on everybody. You'll start getting mad at everybody because you don't know how to manage your pain and you medicate it with something deadly. And just because it doesn't kill you today doesn't mean it won't kill you in the prime of your life in the prime season of your joy. That is what pain does. It drives you to an end. Let me close with these questions. Every leader has to have a pain tolerance. A friend of mine called me, oh man, he just, he was so sad. He's the best. He's my, one of my best friends. He said, PD. I said, what's up, dude? He said, man, I don't, I don't want to bother you. I hate when people say that. If I answered your call, you ain't bothered me. I could have sent you the voicemail. If I answered, I intended to talk. 
And I, I said, hey, um, one, of my, one of my highest traits is I, I value, value loyalty. I value relationships. Um, and so um, he calls and he says, man, he's a pastor too. He said, man, one of my, one of my worship leaders quit on me, man. And I listened to him crying. He wasn't physically crying, but he was basically crying on phone. I, I just, I don't know what happened. It just, they've been with me for a while and they just quit. And I listen to him because it's important to let people get out of, the, get out of them what's in them. And I said, uh, yeah, man, that sucks. But that's the level of pain that's going to take to make you a better leader. Why could you say that? Because I know what it's like to invest your time, talent, prayers, effort, and someone walk out and not even give you the courtesy of telling you they're leaving. I don't understand. I said, some pain you don't have to understand. You understand it better on the other side. And, and like I said, I said, you know, but there, there are ways you can handle that that I've learned that I could have done better that I want you to do better. Because most people will dog you on their way out. They celebrate you on their way in. But so they can feel good about their decision, they got to dog you to justify what they wanted to do all along. So leadership says this, shift above it. See, as a leader, here's what you got to learn. Nobody cares about their response. Your response gives their response validity. Y'all ain't talking to me today. This is worth more than what you know. But it's about pain. I want to give you these seven questions that are very helpful. They're a little practical. They're not theological, but they're practical because here's the thing. Most Christians do a great job knowing they have pain. But they don't do a good job fixing what they know. God, I'm a sinner. Okay, we know that. But how are you going to fix it? And so we spend our entire lives knowing and labeling ourselves what we are, but never transforming into something better. Don't be that person. And I get it. We all are that person because sometimes we don't know how. Like, I got a problem. Good. That's the first step. But what are you going to do to fix it? I don't know. I just know I got a problem. And most Christians spend their entire lives at the altar just saying, I got a problem. Number one, where is your pain? Because all of us have it. What causes you to put walls up when you should be putting up gates? Walls keep people out, gates bring people in. What does your pain feel like? Where is your pain? What does your pain feel like? Yo, listen, if I were to do marriage counseling, which I don't, I would be asking these questions. Because pain shows up and you've never seen it before. And now a year from now, you're like, I don't know what I got myself into because I didn't know their background. Number three, how often do you feel pain? Because some pain ain't every day. Some pain is seasonal. It may be the holidays that make you feel pain. You got to know what, what triggers your pain. Like I said, when, when I heard DMX die, it triggered something to me. I don't know DMX, never met him a day in my life. I, I do have some type of sentiment about it, but I also know that a lot of times what people say, oh, everybody, it really bothers me, and I'm not, I don't think that people shouldn't do it. I think it's fine that they do. It really bothers me when people say, man, we love DMX. I sometimes say, we oftentimes get it confused. We loved his gift. Amen. 
no, listen, y'all. This is going to help you. This, this is going to free some of you. Some people don't love you. No, 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 no. Just don't, don't say amen to that. They love your gift. Let's not get it twisted. Some people just love your gift. That's dangerous because when your gift stops, so do you. No, 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 don't get it twisted. When I meet people and they meet me for the first time and they're like, man, I've been following you. Bro, I love you. I'm like, no, you love what I do. You don't love who I am. Because to love who I am means you got to get to know me deeper than what I do. Come on, church. I'm not disappointed if you don't help me. You never love me. You love what I did. There is a difference. And if I believe that you love me because of my gift, I'll be sadly disappointed. Because you'll buy my music when I die, but when I was alive, you just watched the play. So you gave me all the honor I deserved when I was alive, when I was dead, when I couldn't receive it, because that's just humanity. That man don't love you, he loves your... Never mind. I love you. got to be able to distinguish the two. Some women don't love you. They love what you got. You, you, you a business guy and you online, you showing everybody you got money and everybody want to hang with you. You really think they like you? Let you stop buying bottles. Let you stop feeding everybody. Let you stop paying the bill and then you'll really see who really loves you. You know who loves you when pain hits your life and they show up. to know it's critical to know the distinctive difference let me hurry up so y'all can it's raining anyway so it's all good. When, when do you feel the pain how, how, where is the pain what does the pain feel like how often do you feel the pain how often do you feel it when do you feel the pain? <laughs> setting for the pain. That's the next one. Setting for the pain. What setting causes the pain to activate? You know, some people, when they hear the word, I love you, that's a setting that just sets them off. Because the last person that told them they loved them raped them. You, you got to know the setting. What triggers me is when people are like, I'll be with you always. I'm like, child, I heard that a long time. I don't even hear that again. That's a word. That is the worst line to get a PDS check. I'll be with you forever. I'm like, come on. I, I got a t-shirt to wear that too. Because you got to know the setting that brings you that. Somebody said, man, I'm with you when you're right. Well, what happens when I'm wrong? Because you're not always going to be right. All right, number six. This is a very important one. Woo, this is a very important one. What makes your pain feel better? We all got something that makes it feel better. For some, it's food. That's, that's definitely happens. Food. What, what makes it feel better? What, what makes your pain feel better? Whatever that it is, is what's killing you. Listen, y'all, some of the stuff that we're doing is we're crowning our pain. But you can't crown pain. Pain is there to do a job. 
You can't anesthetize pain. Number seven. This is a different question. What else does your pain cause you to be painful about? Which means, does your pain cause you to act a certain way and now it affects your family and now you're pained about your family? So when you get to a season of depression, you hurt everybody that loves you. It's just not enough to come to the altar and know what you're doing. You got to know, how am I going to deal with this? And when I know what it is, how am I going to get out of this? Because it's not enough just to turn around seven times. Listen, most Christians die in their humanity while worshiping their divinity. I know who I could be in Christ and we spend all our time loving that but we don't spend our time dealing with the humanity and what I'm just afraid of is that many of us will work so hard to let our success vehicle we drive, whatever we achieve, be a blanket to what is obvious. You got to have a plan. And I encourage you today, if you're watching this by Restream or one of the gracious members of TKC said, man, that message was so good. I need to send it to my friends. I'm not pointing at you. I'm just saying you just need to hear it. That's why we have people who are anointed and nasty. Because they don't know how to deal with their pain. I'm seriously praying for you and I pray you pray for me that you who are suffering in pain don't die in the silence of your pain see what Christianity does is it makes you feel like Jesus can accept any sin you have which is true the other side of the coin is it also limits you on letting people see the side of your nakedness. Now, I'm not saying go online and be naked to everybody. And when I mean naked, I mean just proverbially, not physically. But the scare is this. Some of you will be lifting your hands to Jesus in worship. And you'll be just like many of our fellow brothers and sisters medicating your pain in a way that's eventually going to kill you. I'm not going to ask you to come to an altar because that's, that's not what this is. Number one, I must acknowledge Jesus is the one that needs to hear my pain first. He, he, needs, he, needs, he needs to hear it. Because if, if God can't heal what you won't reveal, He already knows, but you gotta, you gotta reveal it. But then secondly, y'all, maybe you need to go see a counselor to get that pain fixed. No, 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 no. People shouldn't have to deal with your dysfunction because your dysfunction has become normal. That's what Christianity is. It's 
dealing with pain and bringing it to a Savior that understands. How did Jesus deal with pain? He would leave his disciples and go up on a mountain to pray. There was no way in the world he could amass what he was doing without figuring out a plan to deal with when life was overwhelming. That's why people at their highest level can take a gun and blow their brains out. Because they can't deal with the pain. You need a place where you can be naked. Don't come in the doctor's office dressed up. Because the doctor can't fix you when you're dressed. I'm praying. God, I pray that this hit home. I pray it resonated. God, help us to deal with joy, which sometimes is so much easier to deal with, but on the other side, there is a guilt to joy because some people feel bad when they're blessed by God. There is a sorrow that comes with being prosperous and others are not. That's why you said, when I give you, when I prosper my children, I add no sorrow to it. It's indicative that there's a sorrow that comes with achievement. So Holy Spirit, today I pray that it, this is not just a word they'll hear today, but they'll, they'll listen to, they'll re-watch, they'll replay that I felt today that you said what you wanted to say. So Holy Spirit, help us to have a plan to manage pain. And if you're here and you're not right, God, today's your day. PD, I ain't, I'm, I'm not. I'm not right, and I want to get right. If you're online, I want you to text the word Jesus to 407-449-8884. That, that's the only way we can connect with you virtually. But if you're in the sanctuary, I want you, if you're here, you're saying, PD, I'm, I'm not right with God. And I want to get right. I'm not here to judge you because you're not right. I think that's great that you came. And if that's you, would you just have the courage and the boldness just to lift your hands and say, Pastor, that's me. I want to get right today. I want to get right with God. I want to get right with God. God bless you. I want to get right with God. Lift the hands up high so I can see them. It's a little dark for me. God bless you in the back. Would all of us repeat this with me? Let me tell you, a prayer doesn't make you saved. It's the, it's the confession of your heart. Once you get saved, now the journey is not staying saved, but allowing the Holy Spirit to make sure that your confession of your lips matches your walk. And that only can be done through the Holy Spirit. So I encourage everybody that is a believer, tomorrow's April 12th, start off by reading Proverbs every day. Read it from the Message Bible. Take a pen and paper or your iPhone or your Samsung. Write notes on what you felt God was speaking to you based on what you read. So every day, April 13th, read Proverbs 13. I want you to write every day what God was speaking to you. That's going to start dealing with some of the things that you need to. And you will see transformation as you continue to follow the Word of God. The Word of God is the spiritual food that you need to see the change that you want to see. Everyone repeating with me as loud as you can. Father, I come to you, a sinner in need of grace. I pray for the pain that I have. I bring to you my Lord and Savior today. I request you save me 
from my sins. My sins crucified you. My sins keep me away from you. Holy Spirit, I receive your help to lead me and guide me into all truth. Father, I need your help. I pray that you would help me not be afraid to talk to you, to communicate with you. My pain, my pleasures. Holy Spirit, wash me. Make me new. Make me whole. I'm saved, filled with your spirit, washed in the blood of the Lamb of God. I am yours, forever yours, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Lastly, we have, we have baptisms that we're going to do at the exterior of the service. Please stick around for those if you can. I do want to tell you that prayer is nothing deep. It's just a conversation. You don't have to pray like old mothers pray. You don't have to scream when you pray for God to hear you. You just need to have a conversation. Every day it seems like I wake up at 3 a.m. and I just have a conversation with God. I just talk to him like a regular person. I just tell him where I am and what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking of doing. Sometimes he speaks back, sometimes he doesn't. But when he does, I write it down. But it's just a conversation. I talk to God like I talk to you. I don't go before him and say, thou art the God who. He already knows who I am. You don't have to perfect yourself to pray. You just have to pray.